Well, thank you very much, Amanda, and very good to be here with you all today. Like you, Amanda, I'm a, I, I used to be a lawyer, but like you, I've put my past behind me and moved on to several different careers, actually. My family maintained I've been unable to hold down a career, let alone a job. Um, and, um, uh, 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 but one of the things I've never been is a, a techie. Um, I um, uh, became associated with digital because of GDS, but that was very much based on uh, the work that, that others did. Uh, but the story of my involvement with this subject starts in 2010, um, and um, when, with some resonances of uh, the scene today, uh, the British government faced a fiscal crisis um, and a, a budget deficit of 11% of GDP needed to do things differently. So uh, the, one of my main job was really, as Minister for the Cabinet Office, was to take out the cost, the overhead running cost of government, which strangely no one had ever really done before. And I always feel a bit embarrassed describing this to people from the business world, because in the business world this would be kind of routine. Uh, that you would run your procurement in such a way as to maximize uh, quality and benefit and, and, uh, at the lowest possible cost. You would uh, reduce, manage your property occupancy in such a way as to uh, have the best um, um, conditions for people at the lowest possible cost. You would co-locate people. You would, uh, 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 and you would run your um, contracts with your big suppliers in a whole of uh, operation way. Uh, and this was far from what we found was, was the case. And so uh, immediately on coming into government in 2010, we set up the Efficiency and Reform Group to, to look at really how the money was being spent through the cross-cutting functions that run across government, but also run across any big, complicated organization. So procurement and commercial, uh, IT and digital, uh, property, uh, projects, the running of major projects. Uh, and by setting up a central authority with spend controls, where we could actually stop money being spent on the wrong things or in the wrong way from the center of government, uh, we were able to redirect how the money was spent. Uh, uh, and the, in, in short terms, the, the outcome of that was in the space of five years, we cut cumulatively adding one year's uh, savings to another, uh, more than 52 billion pounds from the running costs of, of government. Um, and uh, learned a huge uh, amount from that. Um, and. As I say, no one else in any government had ever really done anything quite like this, uh, and none of, very little of it was um, particularly innovative, except in, in a government context. Um, but um, uh, when I finally extricated myself from government, um, about 35 years after I first entered, 30 years after I first entered government in the uh, 1980s, I left government in 2016, set up FMA, really to take what we had learned to see whether it could be of use to other governments in other parts of the world. And we're now around 50, 55 people, slightly depending on how you count them, including my friend Mark Lundstarkey, who joined us uh, uh, earlier this year from GDS to lead our digital uh, practice. Um, and we're now working with governments. Uh, we have worked with governments in, I think I can technically say, every continent of the world, although Africa is uh, not very much so far. Um, so that's, uh, that's, my, uh, that, that's how I came to be involved in, in all of this. And of course, one of the things we had to do was to get a grip on the government's IT. Um, at that stage, the UK, I don't want to boast, but the UK had the most expensive government IT in the world um, uh, per head of population. Uh, and 87% uh, of that spend was with seven uh, suppliers who objected violently when we occasionally described them as an oligopoly. Um, they thought that was extremely rude, but it was also pretty accurate. Um, and, uh, 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 and the way was we were purchasing uh, IT services was insane. Um, 
we found that our spend was in these huge multi-year contracts, deeply impenetrable, opaque contracts uh, with the big systems integrators where no one really knew what um, the money was buying or what was it was being spent on or what, frankly, the terms of the contracts were because there were so many alterations. Um, in the contracts that actually no one on either side really knew what the contracts uh, by that stage were. Um, and of course every single part of government was contracting separately with all of these big suppliers and so there was uh, no, the government was getting no benefit from the scale uh, that a big organization ought to be able to get from buying as one. So we started to change uh, all of that. Uh, and. At the same time, we were at that stage where um, digital was, was becoming a thing, had become in many places a, 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 a thing, and, uh, but in government there was no real concept of what was involved. Um, one government service was said that it had fulfilled Tony Blair's um, uh, edict that all services should be an online service by saying that you could download a form online, print it, fill it in by hand, and send it off by mail. And they said, well, we've ticked that box. It's now an online service. No, it isn't. Uh, and so there was a long, long way to go. And we had the benefit of having in number 10 Downing Street a couple of advisors who did get this. I mean, they were kind of uh, deep converts to uh, the benefits of digital uh, and who proselytized it and evangelized it um, uh, so that when we started down this path we had the backing of, of, of number 10 and, and the Prime Minister who gave uh, pretty unstinting support to what we did. And early on I asked uh, Martha Lane Fox who had, had been the government's digital champion uh, under Labour to stay on in that role with us. Uh, she willingly agreed. I got her to do a quick report. She said, you've got to do two things. And she, I mean, it was all in her head already. She just needed to write it down. Um, I need to do two things. You need to have a policy of digital by default. If something can be delivered online, it should be delivered only online. Because she said, what happens is governments do their best to create a digital, an online service, but then it's never good enough. And so they never actually get round to turning off the offline services. So you've still got post and face-to-face -face and telephone uh, and all the rest of it. So it needs to be digital by default. And she said the second thing is you need to find the best person there is to be the government's chief digital officer. And so I said, well, okay, who is it? And she said, there's a guy called Mike Bracken who happens to be sitting just down here who you're going to be hearing from in a bit. So we persuaded Mike to come into government to, set, to lead and set up the uh, government digital services, which has became a great success, a huge success. Um, and um, as a result of the work that Mike uh, led across the government, um, the UK got ranked best in the world in 2016 for e-government by uh, the United Nations. Uh, and um, uh, and the, you're familiar with a lot of the rest of the story. Uh, Gov.uk won the Design Museums Award for Design of the Year. It's, you know, it's no discredit to say that it's not a thing of extraordinary aesthetic beauty, but it works because it was built around user need uh, and everything that we promoted through GDS was around user need. What is the user need? Uh, government services typically get delivered according to the convenience of the government, how the government happens as a matter of historical accident to be configured. Uh, and this is not useful for the citizen who actually doesn't care which ministry or which agency of the state even uh, that is providing what they need, the information or the services they need, it's the government. And so you need to act as the government uh, and configure what we do around the needs and the convenience of, of the citizen. And in all of this, um, open was central to what we did. Uh, open source software, um, open standards, crucial, um, uh, particularly when it came to interoperability. Um, there were so many government systems, IT systems, that were incapable of, of in any kind of interoperability. Um, 
uh, but open standards and open data. Uh, we ran, I think, the biggest open data program pretty much anywhere in the world at the time, uh, releasing data sets and uh, tapped into a rich vein of creativity in the, discovering the reasons why data sets couldn't be made available. Um, uh, and, you know, national security, commercial confidentiality, and at the end of it all, the, the last resort, um, people would say, well, Minister, the quality of the data isn't good enough. We need time to improve the quality, and then we can publish it, to which my response was, publish it, and you'll find it gets better quite quickly. Uh, partly the embarrassment factor, but also the crowdsourcing um, uh, that, uh, that, that, that happens. So open was absolutely central to all of this. On open source um, uh, software, what was the resistance? Well, security, um, and you know, the, uh, and um, there are answers to that which are being discovered. And there's good work going on, I think, in the, the U.S. on how to counter the concerns on uh, security. But a lot of it was simply anxiety. Uh, and what we realised was there just weren't enough people around in government who understood this stuff um, and who were capable of being the intelligent customer. Because the obsession with outsourcing, and by and large, you know, I'm not against outsourcing. I'm a conservative. I think outsourcing can often be the right answer. But actually, what we had to do was insource a lot of capability, because in too much of government, the, the ability to be the intelligent customer and to be able to integrate different parts, different services inside the government, it had gone and it had to be re, uh, reconstituted. And so that lack of knowledge and that lack of confidence to engage with something which wasn't familiar uh, was a big obstruction, a big uh, uh, source of, of resistance. So we had an open first um, uh, approach. And we also had um, a, a cloud first uh, policy. Uh, and, um, and honestly, you would not believe the state of uh, data hosting across the government. Um, there was, there was well over 90% redundancy. Um, most departments didn't know where their data was being held. A lot of it was being held, it was being hosted by the SIs who they had these huge contracts. Um, quite a lot was being uh, it held in house in sort of funny little data centers, which made people feel comfortable because they could sort of see the boxes and they could see the red lights twinkling and hear them whirring and think, well, that must be good and secure uh, because we can see it. No. Um, uh, and a, a lot of resistance to moving on to, into the cloud. Which, and, and reasonably, it was in the early days of, 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 of cloud computing. Uh, and so eventually we, uh, but there was some, some movements, it, it, it began at, with massive savings, a massive save, financial savings as well as improvements in quality. Uh, one particular hosting service was um, uh, re-tendered and w th there was a, a saving of 96%. Um, yes, a saving. The cost of, of hosting in the new, by the new provider was literally 4%. Of, of the previous cost, so huge savings. Um, and, and we eventually created um, uh, Crown Hosting as a joint venture between a private sector partner and, and the Cabinet Office, as a, really as an interim, as somewhere where uh, departments and agencies could shift their hosting into it uh, as a staging post towards um, putting uh, it eventually into the public uh, cloud. Uh, that was actually very successful. It's now, and it's now still in operation, largely now as a place where uh, data that is genuinely has a high uh, security requirement can be, uh, can be hosted in a way that gives confidence to people in government. And it's, it, it's um, a handle, I think, nine times as, as much um, uh, as, w as was expected as delivered 1.5 billion uh, pounds of savings. Uh, and the lesson with all of this is, um, in order to make transformational change of this type happen in government, it, first thing is it doesn't happen spontaneously. Um, it needs leadership uh, from the center. Um, I provided, I think, political leadership. Uh, Mike provided uh, technical leadership and, and gave confidence and brought people, found the allies, you found the coalition of the willing around government who could be mobilized 
behind this, this movement. But at the end of it, you have to have some authority uh, behind it. You have to have a mandate um, because, you know, with all the goodwill and all the buy-in and all the taking people with you and convincing, all the kind of Theodore Roosevelt, speak softly, persuade, convince, get the buy-in, at the end of it, you have to have a bit of a big stick, um, and that is the mandate, which is we can stop you doing the wrong thing, and we can help you to do um, the right thing. And I'm now embarked on um, uh, um, a, a review, doing pro, pro bono personally, a review for the government on governance and governance and accountability in the civil service, which is the last stage in my uh, therapy. Um, and, um, uh, and, and it's striking how much, when you read back over the st story of change and reform of the civil service, how the same themes <coughs> recur time and time again. It's deja vu all over again. You read the Fulton Committee report from 1968, and, and that was not new. That was kind of picking up critiques which had been around for a long time. And then you read what... Uh, Kate Bingham has written and said about the uh, civil service from her experience of being immersed in, in to do as a volunteer work of intense national importance, creating the, leading the work to create the COVID vaccines. Um, and it's the same story, the same issues come up again and again. Um, generalists, um, you know, clever generalists mostly, but crowding out uh, people with specialist knowledge, particularly um, with scientific and technical knowledge, uh, churn, people moving randomly from one job uh, to another without any consideration of the business need, and that militates against creating these deep pools of specialist knowledge which are important. Um, the impermeability of the civil service, its um, unwillingness to attribute value to experience gained outside the civil service and unwillingness to um, use that, ex that experience from outside and knowledge of different cultures, different organizations, which good organizations use to, to strengthen themselves. Uh, and what I concluded was there's no one in charge um, because the um, head of the civil service is a, basically a side hustle for uh, the cabinet secretary or someone doing another job. And, uh, and it's possible that you might find in the same person the, the right person to be the best possible principal advisor to the prime minister, who's also capable of leading a huge, massive uh, change management program in his or her spare time. But it's quite unlikely. Um, and uh, so there isn't anyone in charge. Um, the functions that we, the functional model that we started to create it has in some of them actually been strengthened since uh, uh, my time, but in others has been uh, eroded, uh, and the ability to drive change has been eroded. Uh, and there's no one to who, if you could create this um, uh, role uh, in, of someone in the middle um, with authority over the whole civil service to drive this massive transformation program that's required, who's going to hold this person accountable. And the textbook answer, of course, would be ministers. But that's not going to happen. And, you know, I've been the minister who tried um, to do it. Uh, and I was more interested than most, and I stayed there longer than most. Um, but the truth is that uh, a change management program of this kind is going to take a long time. It'll um, transcend the life. I mean, what's the, what's the shelf life of a prime minister these days? Uh, <laughs> But I check, check my phone, <laughs> see, see what's happened. Um, but even in normal times, um, the shelf life of a prime minister rarely exceeds uh, uh, the time scale needed to really to drive through a change management program of this kind. And so you need someone outside ministers uh, with, a, with a role that extends beyond, that transcends the lifespan of a particular administration or a particular uh, minister or, or prime minister to hold it to account. Um, and um, in truth, this probably won't happen. Um, but um, the sad conclusion I reach is that without it, um, the changes won't happen. Um, there'll be attempts made, noble attempts, by high-minded people who want good things to happen, 
but who in many cases simply don't know how to make it happen. As conducting this review, I've talked to a number of former and current uh, senior civil servants, and one of them said to me um, a couple of weeks ago, he said, I totally get the point, I totally see all this, and I totally see the need for it all to happen, but I don't know how to make it happen. Uh, and we put people in charge of government departments who are woefully unprepared for the uh, demands that we're going to uh, make on them. So all of this um, is, is going to have to change. And, uh, and digital will be, needs to be at the center of how any government is organized in the future. And as we know, digital is not mostly about technology. Um, it's mostly about uh, culture and, and process and, and focus uh, and focus on, on people rather than uh, the government. Um, and, and it needs to be led strongly from the center with strong central capability um, and uh, with a bit of a stick at the back of it, but with the ability to lead and provide answers, pro solve problems for, for every bit of government, not to try to do everything from the center. That's not how it can ever work, but, but to lead it uh, from the center. And then it, it needs to be much better understood across the whole of the uh, political and government scene, and which is why uh, I was very delighted that there, there is a plan now to set up an all-party parliamentary group on, on open source. Um, that's going to be a good uh, movement. It's planned. Uh, Amanda will tell you when the d plan date for the launch is. There's some steps to be gone through before it happens. But, but to, get, um, to get those uh, in Parliament, and there are some who know what they're talking about in this field, um, together to promote it, to spread the word, um, and to uh, encourage, uh, hopefully, some interchange with those inside government who need to know more about this and understand it uh, better, frankly, than they do at the moment. That's going to be hugely important. So that's a very good uh, move to take. So it's great to be with you um, today at this event and, and, and to speak with you. Um, and you know, many congratulations to Amanda and her team for the work they do in, in leading uh, Open UK, because this work is incredibly important for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.